Uh, I'm Charles Ball, Associate Chief of Staff at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brandy Van. Uh, Dr. Van is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Defense Systems. Uh, prior to that, she served as the, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Chem Bio Defense. And prior to that, she was the Chief of Advanced Emer and Emerging Threats um, at the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Um, I got to know Brandy when she became the DASD for Chem Bio Defense, and um, she, even prior to COVID-19, was a leader in um, articulating the dangers inherent in the advances in the biological sciences and what that would mean for the peer competition that the United States is in with uh, Russia and China. Uh, in addition to her foresight, she also, um, perhaps just as importantly, is extraordinarily skilled at winning battles within the Pentagon so that um, all of these ideas that she has can actually manifest themselves in programs uh, and te technologies that can enable us uh, and enable the warfighter to be prepared for future contingencies. So with that, I'll hand things over to Dr. Van. Uh, one administrative note here, if you have questions, you can raise your hands, hand electronically or put it in the chat function, and then Mike Albertson will um, take those questions uh, when Dr. Van is, is done giving her presentation and open it up for questions uh, at that time. Okay, over to you, Brandy. All right, hi, uh, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you might be. Um, so first, I'd, I'd like to just uh, send a thanks out to the Livermore team um, between Charles and Mike and Katie and everybody uh, that helped kind of organize this uh, this discussion. So I I come at this with a little bit of excitement <laughs> um, and uh, and I'll say a little bit of caution. Um, the topic matter that we're talking about today, um, because I'm, we're talking a little bit about what we're doing within the biodefense posture review, um, which I'll get into a little bit of details for you all on. Um, but I, I will caveat it by saying that we're still in the midst of it, right? So we're still trying to answer some some of the questions that I'm sure some of you are uh, are going to be very interested in answering. So I will do my best to explain um, what we're doing, where we are, um, and what are essentially some of the more critical decisions uh, and, and opportunities that we've identified that are uh, important for uh, national security. So. As Charles mentioned, um, you know, I, I'm Brandy Van. I work in the uh, chemical, biological, and nuclear defense programs for the Department of Defense. Um, and some of you, uh, you know, looking at who else here in attendance, some of you have worked with us, um, if not uh, in our offices, like Charles, um, and others um, are, are less aware. So I just want to kind of do a quick review for you of kind of what what's our what's our purpose so um really what we do is uh at the at the most simplest form is whenever the secretary of defense or deputy secretary of defense needs a technical expert or advice on matters associated with nuclear chemical or biological defense capabilities we're the office that they call uh, for that expertise and advice um and the NCB, of course, plays a very critical role in the nation's nuclear enterprise, um, and I know you guys are deeply involved in that, but really I want to focus today on, on more of the chemical and biological side of the house. So the NCB office um, is really responsible for making sure that we are maintaining the readiness and the resilience of uh, the department and our joint force. Um, and essentially making sure that we can fight and win no matter what the uh, the environment or the battle space looks like, especially when it is a contaminated uh, battle space. And we do all of that within the context of the president's national defense strategy, um, which is um, kind of what we call soft published at this point, right? So we have a classified version of our national defense strategy. We will be releasing hopefully the unclass version, uh, knock on wood, in the next uh, you know few weeks or so. Um, 
And we are also doing all of this kind of resilience and assessment within the context of the department's first ever biodefense posture review. So that's really where um, I want to kind of focus some of our conversations today and, and where we look at um, kind of what our battle space and readiness and resilience actually looks like. So everybody's aware, right? Over the last two years, three years almost now, uh, whenever the topic of biodefense and readiness comes up, the discussion about COVID-19 um, really takes the center stage, right? And while this certainly has provided us within the community, especially the R&D community, a valuable case study in evaluating kind of our biodefense capabilities and how we maintain operations, there's really a lot more to biodefense. Um, and within our department, we oftentimes do an acknowledgement of COVID and, and future pandemics, but also put out the warning that you know, in the larger context of things, preventing the acquisition of dangerous pathogens, uh, equipment and expertise for really um, nefarious purposes um, and maintaining the capability to rapidly control those outbreaks in the event of a biological attack and the DOD's ability to operate in the biologically challenged areas um, are really the strategic interest to the US national security as it relates to the Defense Department. So as we think about future threats within the context of our national defense strategy, um, we know that there are times we will likely not know if a biological incident is naturally occurring, accidental or deliberate in nature, right? So acknowledgement of this ambiguity of origin is really starting to be built into what we call the DNA of the department, right? So acknowledging uh, attribution will always lag, uh, and thus, we need to be prepared no matter what the risk is, no matter what the threat is. Um, so, uh, and being able to operate across the spectrum of, you know, understanding or uh, recognizing that threat, being able to mitigate and being able to protect people against that threat. So, the inaugural uh, biodefense posture review and then uh, recent efforts related to our national defense policy and strategy development um, has really played a major role uh, over the last few months uh, and, a, and a role in also shaping the interagency national biodefense strategy moving forward. So um, for those of you who, who don't follow this very closely, back in November of last year, uh, Secretary Austin, the, the deputy or the, the Secretary of Defense, signed out a uh, first ever uh, biodefense vision memo. And essentially what that vision memo did was acknowledging, again, the, uh, the, the lack of or the ambiguity of origin of biological threats and the acknowledgement that COVID has really um, opened our eyes that the future of biodefense, especially for our national security, was a critical priority. And so that uh, Secretary of Defense memorandum also asked for the department to kick off this inaugural uh, biodefense posture review with specific tasks. Um, and those tasks were <clears throat> so reviewing first our, our approach to biodefense um, and to include clarification of what our priorities needed to be associated with biodefense, what our roles are, responsibilities, authorities, and capabilities and the like. Um, so, to take a pause on that for a moment, the current administration has really prioritized biodefense based on a number of factors, right? Again, we've talked about this from a COVID lens, but it's not just about the COVID-19 pandemic. It's also looking at the, the rapid advancement within the life sciences, the potential that um, role that these technologies could play in future conflicts with our near peer adversaries, especially, all contribute to the prioritization of biodefense, right? Also included in that is the erosion of our social norms as it relates to things like chemical and biological use. Um, so these are all really critical. And the BPR is really guided by three main principles from that. So first, uh, the posture review is looking to how the department can unify efforts through empowered, collaborative, and integrated approaches across the department. 
um, and with our allies and partners, uh, so globally, including interagency, industry, academia. Um, second, the posture review is looking at how the DOD can modernize our operations and optimize our capabilities, capacity, resilience, and readiness posture. So again, um, end to end, right? So whether it is looking at our force structure and our force designs, all the way through our industrial base and our supply chains. These are all aspects of that um, optimization of our capabilities and capacity. Um, and then lastly, the BPR continues to look at kind of the synchronization of planning with the department's new national defense strategy and through collaborations with like federal departments and agencies, allies and partners, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and really for that, what we're looking at is um, kind of broadly, how do we how do we look at what that demand signal is and then how we shape our response uh, to our global posture and partnering with our, uh, again, interagency allies as well as our international allies and partners to do uh, the best for support for our broader biodefense, <clears throat> excuse me, efforts in alignment with national security goals and strategy. So um, <clears throat> we are, frankly, uh, one of the acknowledgements we have is that we are living in a very exciting time of technological revolution, right? It means that science is cutting edge and in so many ways, the impossible has become possible, right? This is great from cell therapeutics, wearable sensors that detect, you know, early exposure to CB threat agents. Um, we're really seeing the capabilities of tomorrow and er enabled uh, and emerging, right? Um, last week, I think it was, I saw the, uh, on the news that there was the first monoclonal antibody that was uh, in a clinical trial for colorectal cancer and they had 100% efficacy and that's, you know, Absolutely unheard of, but it just amazing kind of technology within those monoclonal antibodies. So it's things like this that we've really taken ideas out of the, the realm of sci-fi, right? To to bring it to reality. And um, so we we have the opportunity to do things like strengthening the warfighters' immune systems, um, looking at, you know, almost um you know, completely autonomous sensing capabilities. So these are all opportunities that are very positive and promising advancements, right? Cell therapeutics is a, is a great example of that. Um, and they can really make benefits to millions upon millions of people, but it also offers and introduces an opportunity for bad actors to use those same types of technologies to advance their own agendas. So if, again, from the BPR standpoint, we are never wanting to shut down these types of technological advancements, but we do have to take an eye to understand what are both the pros and uh, so opportunity space, as well as the, the potential for negative impact and be prepared for what those are, right? Um, so within that convergence of multiple sciences, within the rapid technological ad advancements uh, and developments, adapting to this rapidly changing environment really does require the DOD to align efforts and resources in a different way um, so that we're much more uh, relevant, much more effective, innovative, agile, and ultimately have unified ventures across the domain of our biodefense enterprise. Um, so we also can talk about, um, the, the change in these technological environments also increases contested domains, right? And, and the fact that we continue to see a decrease in traditional obstacles to accessing technology, the NCB is really looking at how to do better innovation at speed and at scale to allow the department to successfully counter uh, a number of those emerging uh, kind of unprecedented events. So, um, so where where are we now, right? And and where do we think we need to go? 
our current state in terms of the threat environment, especially up until recently, we were really defending against a, a legacy list of chemical and biological warfare threats, right? These have been around a while, you know, you have the dirty dozen, you have the this very standard list of chemical agents, and we really knew what we were up against. And we had effective capabilities to, vent, to defend against those, right? And we were really good at doing that. Um, and our warfighters in our nation, it wasn't perfect, but we were pretty well protected and pre had, a, had a pretty good understanding of what, uh, what our capabilities were and were not. Um, and that was then. Uh, what we are facing now is both an acceleration of our natural environment due to due to global uh, global warming, right? We actually see things like the permafrost melting and the emergence of um, you know long forgotten pathogens on the you know nefarious side. We have adversaries and we have technologies that have been uh, enabled to to broaden our scope of what biodefense uh, even is. Uh, beyond the ability to have a list of threat agents, right? So how how does the department or how do we, again, within national security, um, look at that prioritization and look at that capability development in a, in a different way? So um, especially as we talk about kind of adversarial approaches, right? Uh, we have to think about in the past five to 10 years, not only militarily have the global dynamics shifted, but so have the economics and political environment as well. And while the department's focus logically remains on our military, we cannot ignore the implications of our global economic and political changes and how those factors directly impact our ability to maintain the upper hand against some of the most powerful adversaries, right? So each state adversary that has been identified in um, the 2022 national security strategy are actively developing sophisticated and novel capabilities in the hopes of using them to destabilize and weaken the US and our and our allies, right? So with that, you know, I want to pause for a moment and talk a little bit about our national defense strategy as it relates to, to um, you know, how we are looking at our defense posture. So, again, as I mentioned, the unclassified version is forthcoming, but the, the new national defense strategy showcases uh, certain alignments with the, the Biden administration's priorities that I want to want to go through. So, for example, it identifies the uh, transboundary threats such as climate change and pandemics as transforming the context in which the department operates, right? So crucially, uh, the national defense strategy has moved chembio defense from a real siloed and kind of stovepiped um, program and moved it into the broader conversation for preparedness and national security, both home and abroad. So this is really critical and this is really kind of transformational for the, the types of work that we do within the NCB. Um, so now chem biodefense is actually part of the discussions on the defense industrial base. Uh, it's part of broader conversations existing um, in kind of pre-existing treaties and our relationships with allies and partners and governing bodies like the OPCW. And when we're talking about military readiness now, we're also talking about resilient human systems, both in theater health monitoring and in theater diagnostic capabilities, and then ultimately defending the homeland against multi-domain threats posed by um, China really remains central to this overarching strategy. So coupled with that, the administration is focusing a lot on deterring aggression while being postured to prevail should conflict ensue. And as we look at the Chinese aggression in the Indo-Pacific region or to the challenges posed by Russia and Europe, um, this is all part of now the conversation. So China and Russia have all, of course, gained power and military might and are acting with a boldness that has not been seen uh, in previous years, or, or that we thought at least 10 years ago would be uh, unimaginable. And as we've seen with the invasion of the Ukraine, 
Um, Russia has used the idea of nefarious biological labs uh, that are owned uh, or, or at least operated by the U.S. or collaborative with the U.S. as um, as pretext for an invasion, right? So we've been doing a lot of or hearing a lot of misinformation about some of the biological defense activities and biosafety defense, um, activities that um, that we've supported, and I know Charles has supported in the past, right? So we're actually living in a time where information itself has become a weapon and truth has become questionable. Um, and, and we have this now as a power dynamic to think about within our national security domain and our biodefense domain. So that's the threat space we're working in, right? It's, it's very complex. It's dynamic. It's not just about biodefense. It's also about politics and, and the idea of destabilizing effects, um, across the entire spectrum of warfare, right? Um, which also means that we can't just look at chem biodefense or, um, or biodefense, especially in terms of we have a single pathogen and thus we just need boot suits, masks and vaccines to, to, uh, to take care of it. We truly have to think about things both in current military operations, but also earlier in the spectrum of conflict or within it, within the gray zone. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and with. So that deliberate kind of threat evolution will continue, right? Alongside natural and environmental changes that present their own risks, as I mentioned before, and as we've seen with COVID, um, we can't take the view that biological weapons or biological incidents are actually completely separate, right? Um, it's clear that there's a, a significant amount of overlap in the two terms and how we respond to those terms. Again. It's an ambiguity question, right? <clears throat> so um, now we have to grapple with what does that mean in terms of a response and how do we uh, build a structure within the department to mitigate the entire spectrum of biological threats, again, to include natural, accidental, and deliberate. And knock on wood, soon we will actually see a, uh, a new version of the National Biodefense Strategy that is published um, that can help us uh, align our national security efforts underneath that domain. Um, <clears throat> so, one of the lessons that I learned from COVID, and I think we all have, is that no one institution or no one government agency can take on these challenges alone. Uh, and oftentimes, especially as we worked through Operation Warp Speed and some of those technological advances uh, there, and with uh, Health and Human Services, we also saw that the Department of Defense really stood up and supported our global and our domestic mission by su supporting things like our logistics supply chain, right? But ultimately, in the end, it was a great collaboration, whether it was the Joint Acquisition Task Force or Operation Warp Speed, where we saw collaborations um, that removed our bureaucratic barriers and aligned the uh, interest of industry, academia, uh, HHS, and DOD all together uh, with strong partnerships uh, and no matter um, you know, what line you were on in terms of your, your host organization, we were all kind of rowing in the same direction. We are trying to, within the department at this point, identify how we can best keep those ties going, right? Especially as we are looking at some of these new approaches to biodefense and how we can continue to knock down those bureaucratic barriers that prevent collaboration across borders and across lines uh, of effort. Um, something else that COVID, I think, highlighted for us all was the need for situational awareness, right? To extend beyond the Department of Defense and government agencies, but ultimately to the public as well. This includes everything from industry leaders and researchers and, and frankly, the people in this virtual room, right? We needed better understanding of situational awareness, really in terms of real time understanding of not only what was happening within the, the environment and the local communities, but also from the DOD again, mentioning the logistics pipeline, understanding what that material readiness was and what our vulnerabilities were in order to better prepare our supply chains for that. So, you know, 
I'll talk a little bit about um, our biosurveillance pipeline, but I, I, I don't want to forget the fact that our industrial base and our supply chain vulnerabilities actually played a really critical role in COVID and, and plays also a critical role in how we are looking at our biodefense posture going forward, right? So within the BPR, we are separating our capabilities and our reviews into four main areas. And those areas are um, starting with how are we built against our policies and our strategies and our operational posture within the, the global combatant commands, um, but also within the services. And then uh, in, in whether or not we are um, uh, have the right policy documents aligned in order for us to be most effective in, in how we are building our resiliency and our force structure. The second part is um, looking at how do we have our research development acquisition pipeline aligned and whether or not we are funding and putting our priorities in the right places in order to overcome the demands or the vulnerabilities associated with the strategy and policy and plans as they get laid out again by the services, by the combatant commands. The next uh, review that we're looking at is whether or not our um, total force readiness. So again, much more about our medical posture and our medical treatment facilities and how well aligned those are in order to, in the, uh, in the case of an incident, be able to effectively respond and support those within the total force structure um, in the event of, a, of an actual outbreak. And then finally, uh, coming back to that uh, kind of common operational picture understanding, um, under, you know, looking at our industrial base and our supply chain to understand what our logistics pipelines are, our material readiness are, and then really building a common operating picture from, from that as well. Um, I'm sure many of you know that when we start looking at our pharmaceutical base, um, many of our APIs and many of our supplies that are that we rely on, we got constrained within COVID because many of them were coming from overseas, right? So as our logistics pipelines were getting shut down here in the U.S., it made it more and more difficult for us to develop and deliver our vaccine and therapeutic products because we didn't have the raw materials in order to support uh, that development. So those are the types of things that we are looking at within our uh, supply chains and our logistic, uh, logistics pipeline, excuse me. But let's talk a little bit more about biosurveillance, right? So in, in our view, biosurveillance is really critical in understanding what that future operating environment is um, and then ultimately trying to achieve a real time threat awareness in order to inform then everything else in that pipeline that we were just talking about, right? How are we going to respond to? How are we going to mitigate the threat? If we don't know it's happening, uh, then it's very difficult for us to build a, a posture to uh, to respond. So in our mind, you know, biosurveillance includes both the medical surveillance requirements that are needed, right? So the diagnostics data, the metadata from um, force health, but also environmental surveillance measures, right? So what does, um, you know, the air environment around a, a specific facility uh, or broadly look like? What types of uh, environmental triggers might we need to be collecting? And identifying in case of uh, a potential outbreak, uh, and, and can we get an early surveillance from, from that? Um, monitoring, in my mind, uh, for both is really critical. Uh, and further supports really the need for an integrated framework where this information is ultimately acquired, but the acquisition of this information is not sufficient, nor is it sufficient enough to just uh, be able to analyze this information. Really, it's about trying to um, identify and characterize and understand what that environment is in order to affect decision making, right? And affect uh, research and development capabilities, affect um, posturing of logistics and supplies, 
Um, and then also ultimately support things like restricted movement and uh, triage from a medical standpoint and um, in other types of, of decision uh, pipeline information that is necessary. So um, where do we go from here, right? So in order to continue staying ahead of, of like emerging and evolving threats, um, we you've probably heard and, and anybody that's worked a lot with our community has probably heard the term integrated layer defense or defense in depth right so i think this is also really critical um but if you haven't heard this term before uh, let me just kind of walk through it what it really means is that there's really no such thing as a single standalone solution for anything in our our threatened our threat landscape um, so, in order to really adequately address today's threat, it means that we need layers of capability that allow us to protect the warfighter, right? Um, it's not just about a vaccine. It's about a vaccine plus a mask or plus a uh, detection system or, you know, probably multiple layers of all of those things. We need accurate sensors to detect traces of uh, material. We need to have things like suits and masks which keep uh, the threat from going into, you know, our, um, you know, into our respiratory system or mucosal uh, pathways. Um, we also need things like medical countermeasures, right? So monoclonal antibodies, nerve agent an antidotes. Um, we need to be able to decontaminate. So all of these things kind of create a defense layer that is not just one uh, one level short. It's it's actually about having multiple multiple layers and and opportunities for uh, that defense pipeline. So, the concept for uh, integrated layer defense again isn't really new, um, but it was it is still a leap from where we were five years ago, right? Um, I think where we were five years ago is really talking about things in terms of, uh, again, my personal term. I often talk about we used to do uh, youth soccer, right, where everybody was kind of chasing uh, the ball and trying to identify a, a whole host of potential options. In the terms of uh, integrated layer defense in today's language, it's really about doing the characterization sufficient to understand what are the opportunities to layer defense postures against uh, different types of threats, not specific threats, but again, broad spectrum threats. Um, so that's kind of where I've seen the leap ahead within our community go to is thinking less about defense capabilities and silos and thinking about it again from, from kind of a complementary and integrated um, posture or um, looking at it as trying to put all of the puzzle pieces together to see the bigger picture. Um, and we're seeing real success in the CBDP program um, that I used to manage uh, in that, um, that type of um, logical threat analysis and characterization prior to developing capabilities. And so these uh, building up of defensive layers um, has really built an integrated enterprise of capabilities um, rather than having individual parts and pieces. So I think that's really, really exciting. So we're also beginning to see some early benefits for the way that the DOD is now performing acquisition of certain products like uh, within the ChemBio space, and especially within the area of medical countermeasures because of some of these shifts in our mindsets, right? So for ex example, the Kempire Defense Program recently released a uh, kind of a new medical countermeasure strategy. Um, it's a document titled the Approaches for RDA of Medical Countermeasures and Test Products. So if you guys haven't seen that, I encourage you to reach out to, to folks that you know within the CBDP and see if you can get uh, uh, a copy of that document. Um, what this document really does is uh, looks at how we are going to do like a two prong approach to the RDA investments within the medical countermeasure space. Um, and the first one uh, really delivers or, or talks about the delivery of non-specific medical countermeasure products to the warfighter. 
Um, and the other one uh, establishes capabilities for how we are going to do rapid development of very specific medical countermeasure products. Um, so let me let me talk very quickly about the first prong. Um, so the development of non-specific medical countermeasure products, uh, which is something new to kind of um, well, it's new and it's not new for the Chembio Defense Program, but it's an area that we are really seeking a lot of uh, of uh, guidance and assistance from from folks within the community. Um, what this prong really focuses on is developing of medical countermeasures that can help enhance a human immune system against exposure to unknown agents, right? So instead of thinking about chasing pathogen after pathogen, we're actually turning the camera lens, as it were, uh, to the other side and really looking at how the person or the host responds or how we can protect the host holistically rather than chasing um, uh, uh, the, the pathogen pipeline, right? Um, so, for example, um, administering drugs, right, to prep a host's immune system against a pathogen, a broad pathogen, you know, whether it's viral or bacterial or a protein of some sort, um, is is really optimal in in this space right or substances that that target host molecular processes to reduce or slow the rate of disease and kind of general symptomology right um so the chem Bio defense program for example is exploring existing um and novel adjuvants uh or immune potentiators right that can combine with vaccines uh, to stimulate immunogenicity profiles without trying to compromise uh, vaccine safety. Um, and then licensed vaccines known for their ability to trigger a rapid uh, immune system response will also kind of be looked at for um, development and, and determine if kind of systemic states can be created for, uh, again, broad spectrum kind of protection, right? Um, so this is, I think, a really exciting capability area for the CBDP. And again, it just shows um, uh, a slight difference in how we are approaching uh, future medical countermeasures, right? The second prong that I mentioned, the ones that are, are looking for specific rapid advancements in, in uh, development of drugs, um, is uh, is really focused on things like uh, again it, for those of you who know the CBDP, they have a new program out called Guide, which is a uh, the essentially unconstrained intelligent drug engineering. Um, so what they're trying to do there is develop um, a computational system by which uh, you can do drug development, uh, risk mitigation through throughout the life cycle, right? And thus, hopefully, accelerating candidate development and, and enable preemptive kind of um, preparedness activities and rapid response uh, capabilities, right? So, this is really about how do we take, again, the lessons learned from Operation Warp Speed um, without the big dollars of Operation Warp Speed. Um, and how do we then do drug discovery, drug design, and biologic products like monoclonal antibodies, for example, and other kind of small molecule drugs, while simultaneously optimizing the critical quality attributes that you're really needed in order to get to the later uh, stages of that drug development, right? The, the safety efficacy analysis, the manufacturability and kind of the the, the PKPD type um, uh, studies, right? Um, so these are these are all types of technologies that we're we're looking at. Um, and these are all types of technologies that are informing our biodefense posture review. Um, and we're hoping, uh, knock on wood, that by the end of the biodefense posture review, we will have a um, a better aligned, uh, a better organized program uh, and pipeline across the the threat domain to help 
us um, be able to not only respond to, but ultimately hopefully deter uh, against any kind of future biological threat uh, agents. So